So the original study, they looked at 40 patients who had unexplained pharyngeal dysphagia. I think as I've mentioned before, patients often refer their symptoms northward. So they come to us, they tell their doctors, I'm having difficulty swallowing, food gets stuck in my throat, I'm having difficulty taking pills. They point to the upper part of their neck and the doctor orders a modified barium swallow or a video fluoroscopic swallow study. What they found in this original trial, they did, they did a much larger study later, but in this original trial, they found that 14 of those patients, almost half really, um, had esophageal disease that was contributing to their complaints of difficulty swallowing. And 11 of them had a combination of pharyngeal and esophageal disease. These muscles and nerves, as I've already began to explain to you, are very much interrelated. They are attached to one another. They use the same uh, neurology. And so it's what we were seeing when these patients were referred, we didn't understand that a lot of these things were gonna be in the last stage of the swallow. Uh, reflux symptoms are often manifested by laryngeal symptoms, such as hoarseness and coughing, uh, which later, long after I began to do this, we did, began to develop the concept of laryngeal pharyngeal reflux disease and LPR, and the role that that would play in voice disorders. So another reason it became important, I think, for the speech pathologist to, if they were even going to screen the esophagus, they should understand the need to evaluate the esophagus, either by other appropriate testing, such as esophagrams or whatever, or part of their interviewing process with their patients to see if reflux could now be playing a role in voice. And originally that wasn't there, but it became another reason why I felt it was right to teach speech pathologists about esophageal disorders. I think uh, it, it's become very clear. It was Again, that was very controversial in the early days when Dr. Posma and those guys were uh, first trying to link voice problems to reflux disease. Um, and again, they eventually won the day and it's been very well uh, proven now that voice disorder, many voice disorders actually, throat clearing and all of that is related um, to esophageal stage reflux disease. Crical pharyngeal prominence is also a clue to esophageal disease. Many of us would report that we saw crical pharyngeal bars um, and then it was just a notation. It didn't explain what could actually be going on um, and what, 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 what clues that was. Why, why would a why would the cricopharyngeal bar appear in some patients but not others? Why would it become obstructive in some patients and not others? What was the reason behind that? Well, you'll see in a minute that it was related to reflux disease. This slide is from Dr. Peter Carillis, who is Dr. Logeman's um, gastroenterologist up at Northwestern. He's one of the leading uh, gastroenterologists in the nation, uh, one of my favorite physicians I've ever worked with. Um, very, very intelligent man, um, very thorough, very good at diagnosing. And he had this slide in a lecture he gave and he offered it to me. He, he knew I was teaching um, a speech pathologists and he said, give them this as a way for them to start to rule out and help them understand what kinds of dysphagia are gonna result from different types of disorders. And again, I think I've already mentioned to you that when patients complain to me of only dysphagia for solids, I rarely let the modified variants follow even happen. The chances of having some sort of, some sort of tongue or back throat cancer exist, but it's much more likely when it's a dysphagia for solids that it's gonna be found in the lower esophagus. Um, and so I immediately convert or call the doctor and say, can you just change this to an esophagram with speech therapy to attend? And that way, if there's anything that happens oral pharyngeal, I'll catch it when they're drinking the barium, but it, I know that most times it's gonna be down below. And so this will help you figure that out. If, if for instance, the patient has a pulsion problem, uh, you know, whenever I eat, food gets stuck. Even when I drink sometimes, I can feel that the food is stuck in my esophagus someplace. It feels like it's right here and they point to their, um, above their stomach or they point to their uh, mid chest area. If that's true, the causes might be, the etiologies might be echolasia, which we've talked about, DES, which is diffuse esophageal spasm. Um, I'll show you pictures of this. It's sometimes called nutcracker esophagus as well. Basically, it's an irregular peristaltic wave. They're out of sequence, they're out of order, and they're contracting in unusual times, and so you don't get a true wave. It's thought to be by many that DES is the precursor to eventually what becomes echolasia. You see dysfunctioning of the esophagus, and then finally you see that the peristalsis is disappearing altogether, and that is then, of course, echolasia. Uh, we've talked about scleroderma and myositis. I've seen all of these. Um, it's, and it, again, you're gonna get a dysphagia that is for solids and liquids. If it's solids only, if they say, well, I don't have any trouble drinking, then it's much more likely you're going to see a ring or a stricture. I'm going to jump over uh, esophageal esophagitis here for a second. You're going to see some infective uh, esophagitis, and that might be in a patient who is immunosuppressed, an AIDS patient or something like that, or it might be in a patient who's receiving chemotherapy. You'll definitely have pill dysphagias, 
and, um, and I'll show you some pictures of this in a minute. There are dermatological disorders. Um, there's one listed there. I've never actually seen any dermatological disorders that this happens, but it does you'll show up in clinics. We've talked about bar. Uh, in extrinsic compression, so a tumor forming someplace on the outside of the esophagus, such as in the lung or the stomach, may actually push in on the esophagus and cause an obstruction, uh, particularly a dysphagia for solids, or a secondary tumor. The patient may have uh, cancer in the stomach, and it may have spread up into the esophagus, so you'll see it as a primary or as a secondary tumor. And as I've mentioned, these are always sad and very difficult to um, to work on that patient because I think speech pathologists are not necessarily used to dealing with patients who have uh, serious cancer diseases. Um, you're also going to see the potentially propulsive structural and sensory problems of long-term reflux disease, and that's going to be a patient complaining of solid dysphagia. Boy, every time after I eat, I have pain. It hurts when I eat all the time. It hurts when I swallow, the typical symptomology. So have that in the back of your mind. And then the sensory abnormalities are quite rare, um, but they will be, again, for solids and liquids. Some of them will be functional. I work in an area where I have lots of military people, and they are often on medication for pain, narcotic drugs and things like that for serious pain due to injuries. They develop functional dysphagias uh, because the, what relaxes their smooth muscle also relaxes the smooth muscle that is present in the esophagus. So it's, it's a cause that it's being, it's, it's iatrogenic. It's being caused by the medicines that they need, but because they're narcotics and those are so effective on smooth muscle, which helps with the pain, it also results then in dysphagias. And what we end up doing is uh, working with the physicians to modify whatever the drug they're using or how it's being distributed. Are they getting it you know, very quickly? Are they getting a low dose form of it? Are they getting a, a form of it that could be released slowly over time so it won't affect the esophagus so much? Um, it becomes a little bit of a hard thing to deal with, but we do see lots of that here. Um, and then nonspecific uh, esophageal motility disorders. You know what that is? That's a catch-all. That means that we see all kinds of things that are idiopathic that we don't have a name for. The patient simply has difficulty with swallowing. The esophagus doesn't work well. It doesn't fit any of the other categories we have, uh, any of the motility um, disorders that we're used to seeing. It's just nonspecific. And it comes and goes in some people. It worsens over some in some patients over time. Um, and that's what you're going to see. And so that's what that label is actually for. This is a really good image where you'll actually see reflux take place. And um, I'll talk over it a little bit. I want to get the video started. That frothiness that you see there is actual stomach enzymes. There are things in the stomach that begin the digestion. And one of the things that has to happen is that those heavy things like meats and hard vegetables and that, there's reflux. A beautiful, beautiful image of someone just acid refluxing while the camera happened to be in place. And again, see that bubbly frothiness? Um, that's because of the digestive enzymes, which are trying to tear up the material and get it ready for further digestion. Um, and it's very, very telling. And when patients complain to me that they have frothy secretions in their mouth, I'm really likely to start to think about this reflux behind the salivary issue that they're having. If they have dry secretions, it's usually going to be from uh, dry mouth xerostomia um, or some part of medicine they're taking that dries them up. So the secretions are thick and stringy. And so you get two different kinds of saliva, one that's frothy and then one that's thick and stringy. And they basically have two different etiologies. Now, another reason I, in the early days, as I said, I had to justify why I was teaching this and why I thought it was important to some of the swallowing experts in the field. And this comes up a lot. And if, if for no other reason, at least read the chart and see if this patient has a known history of reflux problems. This will be particularly true if the patients are obese. Lots of obese patients have lots of reflux disease. And we see lots of reflux patients and um, people are obese in our medical centers because their obesity causes them to have multiple medical issues, particularly respiratory issues. So these patients often get trached, etc., and then they have NG tubes or PEG tubes placed. And it's kind of your responsibility to make that recommendation that this patient needs long-term non-oral nutrition. That's more often part of that decision-making. So we kind of better know how this person's been swallowing all along and what other diseases are present. If you put a G-tube in someone with severe reflux who is uh, you know, maybe hugely obese, lying in bed where the stomach is pushing down, they're much more likely to have a reflux event from that NG-tube. And you might want to consider lower placement, a GJ tube, for instance, or different bolus feedings. This is where you have to end up working with the dietitian and the doctor to decide the safest way to feed somebody. Um, lots of times, in, particularly in the setting I'm in now, we see reflux aspiration. It looks like it's preandial at first, but it turns out to be occurring long after the meal. 
And it's much more likely in some of these cases that it's reflux disease.